Hello and welcome to my guide to dividend stock investing. I'm very glad you're here and I hope the next 20 minutes or so helps you make sense of dividend stock analysis and speeds you towards whatever your financial goals may be. My main goal in this video is to provide you with a framework to conduct analysis on any stock you may see featured on blogs, videos, or podcasts. This method will cut through the noise and allow you to quickly determine if a stock is going to help you with your financial goals or if it should be left behind. The fortunate thing is that conducting dividend stock analysis is very simple and easy to learn. You don't need to have a degree in finance or understand any complicated math in order to research a stock and the analysis can be done entirely for free. By the end of this video, you should have a very clear understanding of everything involved in analyzing a dividend stock and be confident in making financial decisions for yourself. Let me quickly emphasize something. The strategy is first and foremost a method for saving for retirement and income generation. This is not a get rich quick course. In fact, this is a get rich very slowly but undoubtedly course. There are many different ways to make money using dividends and many strategies for day traders, short term holders, and income investors alike. If your goal is long term, stable, and consistent returns, then this is the video for you. If you want to build a durable passive income stream to quit your job in a relatively short period of time, stick around. If your goal is to moonshot to multiple millions of dollars and tell your boss to shove it in a couple months, go play the lottery or join a crypto discord server. Now that we've got rid of all the speculators, let's quickly overview what we'll cover in this video. First, we're going to talk about why dividend stocks are an excellent way to generate wealth and income in retirement. We'll draw on a couple of studies and talk about the difference between dividend stocks and other passive income methods you might hear about online. The next section will give you a high level view of the strategy and briefly outline the key metrics to look at when analyzing a dividend stock. The following five sections will dive deep into analyzing dividend history, dividend growth, dividend yield, payout ratios, and financial growth. Once we've performed all of our analysis, we'll walk through how to estimate what our total return will be for a potential stock by using a dividend calculator. The section after that will outline exactly how to buy a dividend stock, including cutoffs for the various calculated metrics and drip investing. Next, we'll go through a live example of dividend stock analysis in action, and I'll walk you through analyzing one of my favorite dividend stocks. Lastly, we'll quickly recap and wrap up. None of the methods we employ will require any paid tools and I'll be providing links to free resources as we go. There's some more robust paid tools out there you could use, but I don't think that it's required for most people. Lastly, I need to emphasize that this course does not constitute financial advice. I don't know the details of your financial situation and I don't hold myself out to be a financial planner. This is simply the method that I use to analyze dividend stocks and this video should be viewed for educational and entertainment purposes only. Now that we have all that out of the way, let's talk about how dividend investing can make you very rich. So why should you invest in dividend stocks for retirement and passive income? Why not invest in real estate, a small business, crypto, commodities, etc.? To put it succinctly, dividends provide the best overall return and income generation for the amount of risk taken and time invested. Real estate is a great way to build wealth and generate income, but it requires a lot of upfront capital and a lot of time to manage and grow. It's a full-time job for most people, and not suited for those with jobs or who don't want to spend their weekends unclogging toilets. What about a small business? About half of small businesses fail in the first five years and require significant amounts of sweat equity to get rolling. Other investment vehicles don't provide the type of secure, consistent returns that dividend stocks do, including non-dividend paying stocks. In fact, a 2023 report by Hartford Funds found that since 1960, 69% of the total return of the S&P 500 index can be attributed to reinvested dividends and the power of compounding. According to their research, if you invested $10,000 in an S&P 500 index in 1960 and didn't receive any dividends, your final balance would only be $641,091 in 2022. With dividends reinvested over the same time frame, your final balance would be $4,053,236. A similar report from Global Asset Management found that dividend growth stocks provided both greater returns and lower volatility when compared to the S&P 500 and TSX Composite Index. The most important aspect of dividend investing, however, is the income generation. Unlike traditional stocks where you must draw on your capital to live during retirement, a dividend paying stock will allow you to retain all of your existing capital while you get paid for holding shares of the company. If the stock doesn't cut its dividend and continues to grow the dividend, your income will continue to grow at or above inflation and provide a comfortable retirement with next to no work on your part, leaving you able to enjoy your life how you see fit. This video will outline exactly how to pick the stocks that can provide this type of security. The ideas in this guide are loosely based on the book Get Rich with Dividends by Mark Lichtenfeld, with a few other influences from studies and research papers thrown in. I highly recommend you read this book after you finish the video, and there's a link in the description to buy the book on Amazon. The main goal of this strategy is to find high quality companies that pay sustainable, growing dividends. 
The last thing you want is to buy a stock in a company that pays a high dividend yield, only to have the company cut the dividend two years later and the stock price plummet. There are people who advocate for companies that pay extraordinarily high dividend yields, but these companies are not very good for retirement building because they are likely to cut their dividend. On the other hand, there are companies that pay consistent, safe dividends, but don't yield enough or grow the dividend fast enough to provide adequate income from retirement and keep up with inflation. Our goal is to strike a balance between these two poles and maximize our returns. The companies that fit into this category are mainly boring, blue chip companies that have been around for a long time. They have a history of strong earnings, growing income metrics, and reliable dividend payments. You won't be impressing anyone at parties with these picks, but your retirement account will certainly thank you. The first metric we want to look at is dividend history. The total length of time a company has been paying a dividend is important, but the length of dividend increase is far more significant. Companies that have been increasing their dividend for many years, even decades, are called perpetual dividend raisers. Not very creative. We like perpetual dividend raisers for passive income building because it keeps our dividend income ahead of inflation. Historically, inflation has been eroding purchasing power at about 2 or 3% per year. As of this recording in 2023, the inflation rate is much higher, but the long term trend is still about 2 or 3%. Companies that grow their dividend by at least this amount will grow our dividend income at least as fast as inflation, allowing you to maintain your standard of living in retirement. Companies with long, multi-decade histories of dividend increases will do everything they can to continue to raise their dividend. Long streaks are hard to build, but are very attractive to investors, so these companies have a vested interest in keeping the streak going even through recessions. Dividend growth dovetails right out of dividend history. Not only do we want companies that perpetually raise their dividends, we also want companies that grow their dividends faster than the rate of inflation. It's possible for a company to raise its dividend by one cent every year and accumulate a very large dividend increase streak, but not provide strong returns to investors. A distinction must be made here between dividend yield and dividend per share. When calculating growth, we will be looking at dividend per share and not yield. A company has limited control over their share price, so yield growth is not a good measure of dividend growth. Growth in the dividend per share, however, is what leads to massive compounding and the dividend snowball effect. Calculating dividend growth correctly is very important and we'll be covering this extensively in another section. The second metric we're going to look at is dividend yield. This is simply the dividend per share divided by the share price at the time. The yield can be highly variable since the stock price will likely fluctuate with the market. Again, a distinction must be made between dividend yield and dividend per share. The dividend per share is the actual dollar amount awarded to the shareholder for owning one share of a particular stock. This is what companies focus on growing year over year. This can be confusing at first when you look at a stock with a 50 year dividend growth history, but yields that rise and fall. The yield can change while the dividend per share remains the same due to the change in share price. Next, we'll look at payout ratios. The payout ratio is the amount of dividend paid divided by some income metric. It's also a measure of the safety and sustainability of the dividend. If a company is paying everything it earns out to shareholders in the form of dividends, it has no cash left to invest in the growth of the business. It also means that a drop in earnings can threaten the dividend, resulting in dividend cuts. There are many, many income metrics to look at and potentially hundreds of different payout ratios. We'll be covering the most important ones, giving very special attention to how to calculate the payout ratio and what a sustainable payout ratio looks like. Lastly, we'll look at financial growth. Strong companies have healthy financial growth. If a business is going to continue to increase its dividend and total return, their income must also be growing. Regardless of whether they pay dividends, a company with slowing or declining earnings will likely lose investors and yield negative returns. The same principle applies to dividend investing. In our section on financial health, we're going to learn how to calculate the trendline growth in cash flow from operations, free cash flow, operating income, and net income. These metrics will give you a strong sense of where the company is headed financially and the long-term viability of the business. To recap, the primary metrics we're going to consider for dividend analysis are dividend history, dividend yield, dividend growth, payout ratios, and financial growth. This is the meat of the quantitative analysis needed to determine if a dividend stock belongs in your portfolio. By the end of this video, you will be able to quickly and accurately calculate all of these metrics for any company listed on exchanges around the world and be well on your way to securing your financial future. Let's get started first with dividend history. Companies that have been raising their dividends for many years will likely continue to do so. Once a business has several decades of dividend growth behind them, investors come to expect continued dividend growth. If the company is not able to fulfill that expectation and fails to raise the dividend, the executives know investors will flee and a drop in share price is sure to follow. Dividend cuts and a stagnant dividend are perceived as signs of financial weakness so the board of directors will do everything they can to keep increasing the dividend. There are many websites dedicated to tracking the dividend increase streaks of various companies. The first we're going to talk about is Dividend Radar. Every Friday afternoon, Dividend Radar publishes a free spreadsheet of perpetual dividend raisers. 
They break these companies into three categories, challengers, contenders, and champions. Challengers have raised their dividend for five to nine years, contenders for 10 to 24 years, and champions for over 25 years. These stocks also must trade on US markets. The spreadsheet also provides helpful information on yield, share price, dividend per share, dividend frequency, and a whole lot more. This is my first stop whenever I'm looking to buy more dividend stocks. If you download the sheet in Google Sheets, you can also easily sort the results by sector, yield, increase history, and any other metric you choose. MarketBeat is also a great resource for perpetual dividend raisers. Right now they have a list of dividend aristocrats and dividend kings that has proved very useful to me. For a stock to qualify as a dividend aristocrat, they must be in the S&P 500 index, have increased their dividend for at least 25 years, have a market capitalization of at least $3 billion, and average at least $5 million in daily share trading for the past three months. To qualify as a dividend king, the company must meet all the requirements of a dividend aristocrat, but also have a dividend increase streak of at least 50 years. Although you can pick stocks that don't have long dividend increase streaks, I wouldn't recommend it. Companies with streaks of 3 to 5 years aren't as deeply invested in increasing their dividend as the ones on these lists. Over the long term, dividend growers outperform non-dividend paying companies and dividend cutters, so you want to take as many precautions as you can against dividend cuts. These lists are a great starting point, but we need to verify the accuracy of the dividend history as well. To view the dividend history of a stock, you have a couple of options. The first is to go straight to the company's investor relations page and pull up or request their dividend history. Most websites have at least the past several years readily available, but you may need to email the investor relations contact and request their full dividend history if it is limited or not available. Another option is to visit nasdaq.com, seeking alpha or market watch and look up the symbol. Oftentimes these websites will have dividend history from many years back. Once you find the dividend distribution data, simply count the number of consecutive years the company has increased its dividend to find their increase streak. This isn't the most efficient method, but it does work. In general, the longer the dividend increase streak, the better. All other things being equal, a company with a longer dividend increase streak is more likely to continue to raise their dividend than one with a shorter streak. I normally shoot for a minimum of a 10 year streak. This is long enough that I know the company is serious about dividend growth, but not so long that it boxes out potential gems I would have otherwise missed. Now that we've talked about dividend history, let's take a look at how these increases can keep our income ahead of inflation in the next section by calculating dividend growth. Once we find a company that perpetually raises their dividend, we want to make sure that the growth is fast enough to keep our dividend income ahead of inflation. Sometimes a company will increase their dividend by minuscule amounts just to keep up their streak, resulting in distributions that slowly erode your purchasing power. Historically, inflation has grown at about a 2-3% pace. Right now, that rate is much higher, somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 or 9%, but let's assume this is transient and over the long term inflation will return to its historical rate. So how do we calculate what the dividend growth rate is? Instead of going through the complicated process of downloading historical data, performing linear regression, and estimating growth, we can simply look at the growth rates given to us by various websites that have already done the hard work for us. The best free resource I've been able to find for this data is Seeking Alpha. They easily display decades of dividend history that can be readily viewed on their website, which you can access by clicking the link in the description. Type the ticker symbol of the stock you're analyzing, then click on the Dividends tab, then Dividend Growth. Here we can see the 1-year, 3-year, 5-year, and 10-year dividend growth rates, as well as a forward dividend growth rate based on these historical data. At a minimum, the growth rate should be 4% to grow ahead of inflation. Ideally, the growth is much higher than that. I typically shoot for growth between 8 and 10%. That way, my dividend income not only retains my purchasing power, but also expands it the longer I hold the stock. Oftentimes, there's a trade-off between dividend yield and dividend growth. If your dividend growth is high and yield is low, you may still wind up having the same yield on cost and average annual return compared to a high yield stock with lower growth. If you can find a stock with both high yield and high growth, then you've struck gold. Just make sure all the other criteria are met and reap the benefits. Now that we're sure our stock will expand our purchasing power into retirement through its dividend growth, let's take a look at something a little more exciting, dividend yield. Dividend yield is the return on your investment in the form of dividends. Every dividend paying company distributes a certain dollar amount per share owned. The dividend yield is simply the dividend per share divided by the share price. Dividend yield can fluctuate based on the current share price. Perpetual dividend raisers increase their dividend per share consistently year over year. But since the share price almost never increases proportionally to the dividend growth, the yield may rise or fall as the dividend is increased. In practice, you almost never have to calculate the dividend yield. Most of the time, the yield is readily available on a stock market website or in a stock chart software. Many of the websites we've already looked at have a section dedicated to the dividend yield. MarketWatch and NASDAQ all have this information for account holders and regular visitors alike. Seeking Alpha requires you to create a free account though. 
On MarketWatch, simply type in the symbol of the stock you're analyzing and scroll down to the dividend yield. On NASDAQ, type in the ticker symbol then scroll down to key data. Here you can find the current yield and other important dividend information. On Seeking Alpha, sign in then type the ticker symbol of the stock you're analyzing. Across the top of the page, click on the Dividends tab, then Dividend Yield. I like Seeking Alpha a little more because it gives you a few more yield metrics like average yield, 1, 3, and 5 year yield on cost, among others. On Digrin, simply type the ticker symbol into the search bar and navigate to the Dividend Yield section. Digrin also has a forward dividend yield, which is an estimation of the dividend yield over the next 12 months assuming the dividend is predictable. In general, I look for companies that have at least a 3.5% dividend yield. Not only is this yield attractive for income, it also indicates an advantageous stock price. A company that perpetually raises its dividend and has strong growth may not always have a 3.5% yield, but if market volatility causes the price to dip, the yield could spike to over 3.5%. Many people will say that buying high yield stocks is more risky than lower yield stocks due to a concept called yield trap. A yield trap is something that happens when a company's share price is falling but their dividend remains the same. This will cause a spike in the dividend yield, but if the company's in trouble, they'll probably cut the dividend. Even through dividend cuts, the yield can remain elevated, sometimes above 10%, if the share price continues to drop. The combination of capital losses and dividend cuts will ruin your investment, so it's best to avoid these companies at all costs. The problem with calling all high yield companies a yield trap is that many of these businesses actually pay a high dividend. Some companies are required by law to have large distributions, like in the case of real estate investment trusts or REITs, master limited partnerships, MLPs, and closed end funds or CEFs. The real question is whether or not the dividend is sustainable, which we'll talk about right now. The best way to determine dividend sustainability is by calculating the payout ratio. Payout ratios are the amount a company pays out in dividends relative to some income metric. To calculate it, simply divide the total amount paid in dividends by the income the company generated for the specific metric you're interested in. For instance, in 2022, J&J paid a total of $11.68 billion in dividends. Their net income for the same year was $17.94 billion. 11.68 billion divided by 17.94 billion gives us a payout ratio on net income of 65.1%. Most of the time, payout ratios you see on financial news websites are reported based on earnings or net income. There's a big problem with this. Earnings can be easily manipulated through a few savvy accounting methods. A company is able to deduct certain expenses from their profits to raise or lower the total earnings for a given year and tell a very different story of their financial growth through this method. Companies will often manipulate earnings in this way to give investors the illusion of growing income, which increases share price. A better measure of a company's actual financial health is cash flow. Cash flow is the actual amount of money coming into the business minus the amount going out. Short of actual fraud, companies cannot manipulate the amount of cash they're generating, which is ultimately what they use to pay the dividends. There are two types of cash flow we will look at, free cash flow and operating cash flow. Free cash flow is a more conservative measure than operating cash flow, as it includes capital expenses incurred during a given year. Payout ratios on free cash flow are calculated exactly the same way as any other income metric, simply divide the total dividend paid by the total free cash flow for a given year. Going back to our J&J example, J&J paid $11.68 billion in dividends and declared $17.19 billion in free cash flow in 2022. 11.68 billion divided by 17.19 billion gives us a free cash flow payout ratio of 67.9%. These ratios are pretty close together, but you'll find companies with payout ratios that differ wildly based on the income metric you choose. In general, payout ratios under 75% are going to be safe, assuming the company is growing its business year over year. Even a slight dip in income won't hurt the company's ability to pay and grow its dividend, which allows the dividend snowball to keep rolling and build momentum. The best free resource I've found for calculating payout ratios is MarketWatch.com. On their website, type in the ticker symbol and navigate to the Financials tab. Click on the Cash Flow tab and scroll down to find the Cash Dividends Paid section under Financing Activities for the past 5 years. Free cash flow is also in the Financing Activities section. Cash flow from operations and net income is above in the Operating Activities section. Calculate the payout ratio for the past 5 years and you'll get a decent idea of how safe the dividend is. Payout ratios may be the most important aspect of dividend stock analysis. If a company has to cut or suspend its dividend, you will likely have to sell the stock at a lower price and start over with a brand new stock. Checking up on payout ratios can let you see into the future and predict if a company is about to cut its dividend and get out before it actually happens. Now that we understand how to determine the safety of the dividend, let's take a look at the long-term viability of a company by analyzing their financial growth. Financial growth is a measure of the long-term viability of the company and can help you estimate share price growth. At the end of the day, if a business doesn't generate an increasing amount of income, it'll eventually fail. 
Management teams know that healthy financial growth produces healthy businesses, and investors know this too. That's why if a company misses earnings estimates during a quarterly report, the stock price often drops as investors sell their shares. Financial growth is also very important for the dividend. For a dividend to continue growing, a company's income must also grow. Otherwise, a business will eventually be paying more in dividends than they're earning, which inevitably leads to a dividend cut. Short-term drops in earnings are not concerning if the payout ratios are conservative, but a long-term downward trend in financial metrics will almost certainly lead to higher payout ratios and eventually dividend cuts or suspensions. All publicly traded companies are required to report certain financial metrics to the SEC every quarter, and there are many websites that package these reports in easy-to-read graphics and charts for us to analyze. The main financial metrics we're going to look at are net income, operating income, operating cash flow, and free cash flow. Net income is the total of sales minus expenses, depreciation, interest, and taxes. Operating income is a business's profits after subtracting certain operating expenses like wages, depreciation, and cost of goods sold. Operating cash flow is a measure of the total amount of cash generated by a business's normal operations. Free cash flow is the cash a company generates after subtracting outflows to support operations and pay other capital expenses. These may all sound like the same thing, but there's a subtle difference between income and cash flow. Income statements can include non-cash items like depreciation, while cash flow statements deal exclusively with cash inflows and outflows. Both are important in determining the health of a company, but it's important to understand the difference. There are many ways to calculate financial growth, but we're going to look at just one in this video. We're going to calculate average annual growth over a five-year period. To do this, we calculate the growth for each year, then average them. This may sound intimidating, but we'll go through an example later in the video that will make it much clearer. The best free resource to calculate financial growth is MarketWatch. MarketWatch actually calculates the year-over-year -year growth for us, so the only thing left to do is take the average for each income metric. Typically, we want to see financial growth in these metrics above 2 or 3%, similar to dividend growth. In truth, though, the higher the growth is, the better. Strong financial growth will open up possibilities for management. They can either choose to increase the dividend with the extra cash, which means more income for us down the line, or they can choose to invest in the growth of the business, which will lead to higher share price and larger overall returns. Either way, the result is more money in your account to enjoy during retirement. After we've gone through all the steps above and determined if a stock meets our thresholds for dividend history, dividend growth, yield, payout ratio, and financial growth, we need to check and see how much we could actually earn if we invested a certain amount of money into the stock. This calculation is very easy if you've already done the analysis from before. All we have to do is find a good dividend calculator and plug in the numbers we got from the previous sections. There are tons of these calculators online, but the one I normally use is on marketbeat.com. This calculator lets you plug in the distribution frequency, number of shares, current share price, and many other metrics to calculate your overall return and income over a specific time period. We've already talked about how to calculate most of these metrics, so the last thing we need to find is the expected annual share price increase. Here you can either assume a rate somewhere between 3 and 10% based on the financial growth we calculated earlier, or you can calculate the historical rate and use that. To find the historical growth rate, head over to financecharts.com and type in the ticker symbol. Click on the Performance tab, then Price CAGR. Here we can see the compound annual price growth for different time periods. For J&J, &J, our 5-year compound annual growth rate is 5.76%. Now that we've finished our analysis, let's talk about the mechanics of actually buying a dividend stock. If you've ever bought a stock before, this will likely be very straightforward with one additional step. We talked about them earlier, but let's quickly recap our thresholds for dividend increase streak, dividend yield, dividend growth, payout ratios, and financial growth. I like to look for companies with a dividend increase streak of at least 10 years that has been growing the dividend at least 4% per year over that time frame. Ideally, the dividend growth is closer to 8 or 10%, but 4% ensures my dividend income will keep pace with inflation over the long haul. I also look for companies with an initial dividend yield of at least 3.5%. If the dividend growth is really strong, I may drop this threshold down to 2%. Over a 10-year time period, the dividend growth will make up for the low initial yield assuming the company continues to grow the dividend at that rate. To make sure the dividend is safe, I look for payout ratios on net income, operating cash flow, and free cash flow below 75% unless the company is an MLP or a REIT. These types of companies are required to pay most of their profits to shareholders so their payout ratios will naturally be higher. Lastly, financial growth of at least 2 or 3% ensures the long-term viability of the company and continued share price growth. Even stronger growth opens the doors for management to grow the business or increase the dividend, both of which are wins for investors. If a stock meets all or most of these criteria, it's likely a worthwhile investment. Head over to your broker and place a limit order for the stock you want to buy. A limit order ensures you purchase the stock at a specific price, insulating you from any short-term price fluctuations that could happen with market orders. 
One thing you want to make sure of is that you turn drip investing on. Most brokers will allow you to automatically repurchase stock when dividends are paid. This boosts overall returns and grows your income over time, so I highly recommend you select this option. One exception would be if you are in retirement and need this income to pay for your living expenses. In that case, keep it off and use the cash for whatever you need. Now let's run through an example and tie all of this together. We're going to analyze one of my favorite stocks, Bank OZK, ticker symbol OZK. First, let's head over to Dividend Radar and see what their perpetual dividend increase streak is. According to the spreadsheet, OZK has been raising their dividend for 27 years, well above our threshold of 10 years. This matches up with what we're seeing on Nasdaq.com and on OZK's Investor Relations website. One thing to note, it looks like OZK paid a couple of special dividends in 2002 and 2003. Although their dividend decreased the next year in 2004, their increased streak remains intact since these special dividends are considered over and above the typical distribution. These special dividends are nice, but we shouldn't come to expect them regularly. On NASDAQ, we can see the initial yield is 3.43%. This is slightly below a 3.5% threshold, but let's take a look at the other metrics before we dismiss this stock based on initial yield alone. On Seeking Alpha, we can see the 3, 5, and 10-year dividend growth rates, all of which are near or above 10%. The three-year growth rate is lower than the other rates, indicating they're decreasing the dividend growth, but the chart shows some degree of variability in the growth rates over the past 20 years. I think a rate between 12 and 15% here is reasonable and makes up for the slightly lagging initial yield. Now let's head over to marketwatch.com to calculate the payout ratios. Once we find OZK, we can click on the financials tab, then cash flow to view their cash flow metrics over the past five years. If we scroll down to financing activities, we can see the total cash dividends paid each year since 2018. Now we just need to divide these numbers by the net income, operating cash flow, and free cash flow for each year. For example, since OZK paid $121.12 million in dividends in 2019 and posted $325.95 million in free cash flow, their free cash flow payout ratio in 2019 would be 37.2%. Over the past five years, the highest payout ratio was 47.7% on net income in 2020. This is well below our threshold of 75%, indicating the dividend is safe from drops in income and market volatility. Lastly, let's look at financial growth by calculating the average annual growth of net income, operating income, operating cash flow, and free cash flow. On MarketWatch, we can see net income grew by 2.11% in 2019, declined 31.46% in 2020, grew 98.36% in 2021, and declined 2.57% in 2022. Averaging these values, we find the average annual growth on net income since 2018 is 16.61%. Performing a similar calculation on the other income metrics, we find operating cash flow has grown an average of 7.17%, free cash flow has grown 12.92%, and operating income has grown 16.21%. This strong growth makes me comfortable about the long-term outlook of the company and bodes well for their share price moving forward. Now that we've finished our analysis, let's take a look at how much we can expect to earn over the next 10 years based on our calculations. As of this recording, OZK's share price is $41.89. Let's buy 24 shares for a total investment of $1,005.36. We'll put our dividend growth rate on the lower end of our range at 12% per year and we'll assume 7% annual share price appreciation given the strong financial growth. Our initial yield is 3.43% and the distribution frequency is quarterly. If we also assume a 15% tax rate and no additional contributions, our yield on cost after 10 years is 13.04% and the average annual return is 10.67%. We'll earn more than $150 annually in dividends, and we would have earned a total of over $700 by the 10th year. A 10.67% return puts us a little ahead of the S&P 500 index, with lower volatility and the ability to retain capital as we earn income. The average annual return will increase the longer we're able to reinvest dividends, but 10 years is a good time horizon to see how the stock will perform. Thanks so much for sticking with me till the end, and I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, leave me a comment letting me know what you learned. If it wasn't helpful, also leave me a comment letting me know what was confusing or how else I can help. I want to make a few videos like this, and I know there are tons of ways I can improve, so don't hesitate to let me know. This is a good starting point for general dividend stock analysis, but there are some more nuanced methods for other types of stocks like REITs and MLPs. If you want a video outlining the process for analyzing these types of high yield investments, let me know in the comments. I love dividend investing because it doesn't really require the use of any fancy tools or paid services to get going. We really just used a few sites to do our analysis, digrin.com, nasdaq.com, marketwatch, seeking alpha, and dividend radar. Links to all of these sites can be found in the description of this video. If you like this video, consider subscribing for more tutorial videos like this one, as well as videos analyzing individual stocks I think are good picks for the long term, all geared towards helping you generate more income. I'm also very interested in other income investing strategies to replace regular income, so expect more videos like that in the future. Thanks again. Till next time, stay safe and take it easy.